This week on The Anxious Truth, we're going to talk about panic attacks that come out of nowhere, out of the blue. It's incredibly frustrating, so let's get into it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode 294 of the podcast. We are recording in June of 2024. I'm losing track of time quickly. I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast that covers all things anxiety, really anxiety disorders, and anxiety recovery. So if you've accidentally stumbled upon the podcast or the YouTube channel for the first time today, based on some random Google search or something like that, welcome. I hope you find what we're doing here helpful or useful in some way. And of course, if you are a returning listener or viewer, welcome back. Thank you for your continued support of the work that I do here on this podcast. Today, we are going to talk about panic attacks that come out of the blue or from nowhere, or it's often expressed in the community as I wasn't anxious about anything. I wasn't thinking any particular anxious thoughts, and yet I had a panic attack. But Here's the rub, and and write this down. Well, you don't have to write it down. Just remember it, because we're going to talk about that as we go into this episode. There really is no such thing as an out-of-the-blue panic attack. There isn't. So we're going to talk about that, because sometimes this is counterintuitive, especially if you're spending a lot of time trying to figure out what triggers your panic attacks and then try to manage or avoid those triggers, which is a common-sense approach that most people at least try and then wind up may be stuck on a little bit of a merry-go-round, and we're going to talk about why that is. Before we get into the episode, just two things. If you listen to Disordered, which is the podcast I do with Josh Fletcher, you can find that one at disordered.fm. The one I did last week with Dr. Stephen Hayes on ACT was great, but I was sick when I recorded that one. I'm still sick now. This is kind of kicking my butt. So I'm going to do the best I can to muddle through this episode. I may wind up coughing at you once or twice. I'm really sorry about that. I'm just going to try and get through it as, as best I can because I really, I really do want to do an episode this week. And the second thing is before we get into the topic at hand, just a quick reminder that there's a ton of other anxiety and recovery resources on my website at theanxioustruth.com. If you like what you hear today or generally speaking in these podcast episodes, go check it out. Uh, there are three books that I've written. There's a bunch of like very low cost workshops and seminars but there's also 293 other free podcast episodes and all the social media content and all of that stuff. So if you want more than what you're hearing today, or if this is ringing a bell for you and you'd like to know more about my approach to anxiety and anxiety disorders, you can find all of that stuff on my website at theanxioustruth.com. Okay, that little commercial over. Let's get into out-of-the-blue panic attacks. There is no such thing as an out-of-the-blue panic attack. And what I mean by that is even if somebody doesn't have an anxiety disorder, right? So having a panic attack doesn't mean you have panic disorder. Having multiple panic attacks does not mean that you have panic disorder. In fact, a large percentage of the adult population in the West will have a panic attack at least once in the next 12 months. Like that's not a, a question. That's It's a very common experience, right? Some people have one panic attack in the course of a year, they don't even think about it. It sucks, but they have it. Uh, some people will have multiple panic attacks. They just have them from time to time, but they never develop the disorder. And that's that matters. That's important in our context in the, today's conversation. Because usually people who have a panic attack now and then, or even recurring panic attacks, yet never develop panic disorder, see those panic attacks as very different. They don't care about the panic attack itself. I mean, they do because it's super impactful and very scary and quite disruptive. We all know that. But they tend to focus on what's going on around them in their lives when they have those panic attacks. So they can recognize, you know, oh, my life is really stressful right now. I'm having money troubles. Or my, my schedule is out of control. Whatever. Whatever's going on in, in their lives that's stressing them out or adding to the load is contributing to them hitting sort of the boiling over point where, unfortunately, the response that their body decides to produce is a panic attack. And that's the more common experience with panic attacks in the Western world. But some people have a panic attack and then multiple panic attacks and develop panic disorder, which is where the, the state of panic itself becomes the problem. Like, well, I'm more interested in how I feel during the panic attack and I become so terrified of having a panic attack that I don't want to ever have another one. 
So now what I'm doing is I'm constantly looking and scanning all the time for signs that indicate that I might be getting anxious or excessively anxious or my anxiety levels are rising. Am I moving toward another panic attack? I cannot have that. So when I say that there is no such thing as an out of the blue panic attack, even if you do not have an anxiety disorder like panic disorder, for instance, which often leads to something called agoraphobia, then there is a reason for your panic attack. And you might actually clearly be able to tell like, oh, I was so overwhelmed for the last week that I just melted down. I haven't been sleeping. I completely melted down. And I know people in my life and you may know people in yours that have panic attacks when things are really tough and they're not taking care of themselves and they recognize what that is. Like, oh, I had one of my meltdowns. I have a friend of mine that calls it a meltdown. She's experiencing panic attacks. She knows what it is. It's still terrifying to her, very disruptive. And it, like, it'll knock her on her butt for a good hour or so. But she knows what it is and she looks at it externally. She doesn't interpret it as something wrong with herself. And that makes all the difference. But even then, in that situation, she can identify, generally speaking, what's going on. For people who do develop the disorder, we are scanning it all, scanning for it all the time and doing our best to try and stay calm and stay, you know, air quotes, regulated, <clears throat> make sure that we don't get triggered. I'm sorry for clearing my throat, but I can't, I'm not going to be able to help it in this episode. We're always scanning, we're always looking, we're always trying to manage, we're always trying to manage our thoughts and evaluate. Not only are we scanning, checking, managing, but we're also evaluating. What does, what is that sensation? Is that correct? What does it mean? What about this thought? I'm having this particular thought. What does that mean? Should I be having that thought? I'm feeling this emotion right now of like this vague uncertainty and fear. Shouldn't I be happy? So there's always this evaluation of your internal self, whether it be physical sensations or the thoughts or emotions that you're experiencing, that constant, constant, constant awareness of your internal state. So that is almost going to guarantee that you will, in fact, be on edge all the time. And it more likely than not, it's going to contribute to the next panic attack. It's the whole, you know, what we resist persists. Yeah, that's, that's an old cliche, but it's true. The more we try to not panic because we're terrified of it, the more likely we are to panic again and again and again. And if you listen to episode 66 of Disordered, which I did with, again, Dr. Stephen Hayes, he created ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. It was interesting. He talked about, you know, the common, if you do like well-reasoned common sense things to try to avoid anxiety and panic, then what you actually wind up doing is plugging yourself into an amplifier. And so you wind up in this amplification loop where what seems like common sense, so I'm going to figure out my triggers, I'm going to manage them, I'm going to regulate my nervous system, I'm going to make sure that I'm always calm, I'm going to do my special breathing and tapping, and I'm going to do my exercises, and I'm going to eat my special foods so that I never panic again, and then it doesn't work and you panic anyway at some point in the next week or two, whatever it is, that all crumbles down and now you're back into the same situation and there's that crazy amplification loop where the things you think you're doing to stop the panic or prevent it are actually starting to help cause it. So getting back to today's topic, which is the out of the blue panic attack, it's not out of the blue at all, right? So if you are afraid of your next panic attack, it does not matter, right? It does not matter. People will say like, I don't understand, but I wasn't thinking about panic attacks. That's true. Because we get to the point where you may not be specifically thinking about a panic attack at any given moment, but people who become highly sensitized, who are always in that scanning and evaluation loop, always have kind of one eye inside and one eye outside. So while you might be, I don't know what was going on, I was just outside taking a walk, and next thing I know, I was having a panic attack out of the blue. But some of your attention, because it becomes just sort of your standard operating procedure to evaluate your, your sensations and your body and your thoughts and the things you feel and, and the emotions that you have, that that evaluation loop almost becomes background for most of us. And anybody who has had this experience, and when I was, you know, in the thick of it, I would think the same thing, like today seemed like such a good day. Why did I have this out of the blue panic attack? Well, it's because I was always looking and scanning and checking and evaluating. Even on the days when I thought I wasn't, really, I was. Like, <laughs> at that point, I still was. So it can go, you can go from, this is awesome, I'm in the park with my dog, I'm having a great time, I feel so happy, 
to an instantaneous sequence of events that might start with a thought or an emotion or a sensation and then instantly gets boom, 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 fire. Those things get linked together really quickly because the evaluation mechanism kicks in. And next thing you know, you feel like you went instantly and inexplainably from like playing with your dog in the park to a panic attack. But really, there was an event, a sequence of events there which just happens very quickly. There was a sound, the light changed, the sun went behind a cloud, you had a sensation in your body, a thought popped up. Oh my goodness, I'm in the park. What if something happens to me? That's an almost instant thought. It's so quick, but that is a thought that can you know, catch on quickly. And then boom, next thing you know, the sequence is activated, the launch sequence, if you will, and you are instantly on the path to panic. So it has nothing to do with out of the blue. It's not mysterious. If you are in the business of trying to not panic, then there is no such thing as having an out of the blue panic attack. Because being in the business, whether that's your full time job or your part time gig, and I think you guys, if you're listening to this podcast, I think you kind of kind of get my humor there. I used to say that I was a full time anxious people anxious person. That was my job. So if your part time gig or your full time job is being an anxious person and trying to not be anxious or not panic, then those out of the blue panic attacks are the result of your job. I am my job is to try to not panic. And that guarantees that at some point I'm going to panic while it might feel super frustrating, right? Like, I don't understand. I can't figure these out. I don't know why why I had that panic attack. It comes from out of the blue. I couldn't think of a trigger. I couldn't see a trigger. Nothing was wrong. That's correct. And we can validate the fact that that is very frustrating. You're going to feel frustration. You're going to feel maybe some anger. You're going to feel disappointment. All of those things are valid emotions. Like, yeah, nobody wants that to happen. I don't want that to happen to you. I didn't want it to happen to me. So the emotions that come with that, like, uh, can I just have a nice day? Like, that's fair. We're not trying to take that away. That's a very fair request. Can I just get a break, man? Like, can I just have a nice day or a couple hours where, I, where I'm like a normal person? Everybody wants that. That's okay. So some emotions are going to come with that. You just have to be careful of not falling into the trap of like, well, even when I'm having a couple of good hours, suddenly I'm panicking again. And therefore, I have to spend even more time evaluating, deciphering, figuring out so that I can predict, protect against and fix future episodes which is kind of the default for people who de develop the disordered form, then it's, it's sort of unfair, you know? So you have to be able to express the frustrations of being human and the emotions that come with that. Like, I hate when this happens. I hate when I have a panic attack that just changes my afternoon and ruins my day. Now, we'll, we can argue, if you listen to this podcast long enough, you know that I would argue against that that. It, it ruins your day. Well, it's impactful, yes. But, you know, at another level, we can also say, I get what you're saying. Like, it's okay to have that emotional reaction to it. Just see if you can honor that emotion and express it any way you want to or any way you can in a healthy way. Talk to a friend, whatever. Bring it to your therapist. There's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, you have to refrain from then digging even more into trying to figure out how I can prevent it. Like, because really when it comes down to it, I need to know what caused it is actually code for I need to prevent this. Now, who in their right mind would not want to try to prevent that? We would all want to try and prevent it because it's a really crappy experience. That's true. But at some point, we recognize that like, oh, it's the trying to prevent that's causing the problem or precip precipitating the problem, keeping it alive. You know, the fact that I was working so hard to never panic was why I was panicking so often. So there is no such thing as an out of the blue panic attack. It will feel that way. It will disrupt your day as if it's completely random and out of the blue. But really, what I would suggest maybe if this is an, an issue that you're struggling with right now, you really got to sit and think about this, like how much of your energy, how much of your time, how much of your daily ritual is spent on that? on anxiety, panic, how you feel, checking how you feel, evaluating how you feel, trying to predict how you will feel, trying to evaluate any possible course of action that day based on how it might make you feel. Because I will tell you almost with certainty, 
that if you are in that stage or if you are in that groove right now where you evaluate your day, like, okay, it's Monday, what am I going to do today? And you are doing that, that sort of mental check in that says, Oh, if I go here, mm, I don't know if I'm ready for that, that's going to make me feel bad. If I go here, well, it's really bright, and it's hot out because it's June. And then the heat makes me anxious. So I probably shouldn't do that. If you are evaluating the things that you are going to do, or, or the activities you will undertake in any given day, based on how they might make you feel, then you can kind of stop saying that you're having out of the out of the blue panic attacks. Because what you're essentially doing is saying, I'm going to go into every activity that I do, and I'm going to have both fingers and all my toes crossed to, to hope that I do not panic. And therefore, I will be checking for that. And the more I check for it and evaluate and oh, my God, is it happening, the more likely that is to happen. So there is no out of the out of the blue panic there. It's the scanning, the checking, the trying to prevent it, the trying to control it and manage it. That's the part that gets us in trouble. And it is the explanation. So in a nutshell, if people who want to say, I don't understand why I have these panic attacks, they come from out of the blue, they're often surprised. It's often a light bulb moment when somebody like me says to them, well, I know why you had today's panic attack. Well, why, Drew? Why did you have it? Um, yesterday's panic attack. And if I was like, wait, what? Wait, hang on, say that again? Like, well, yesterday's panic attack is what caused today's panic attack. And usually there's this moment of like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, that sort of makes some sort of sense. It's anxious about being anxious. It's being afraid of being afraid. Like this is part of what defines the disordered state where like the state itself becomes the focus of attention and a lot of time is spent trying to manage that state and avoid repeat performances. So out of the blue, out of the blue or unexpected or random panic attacks, and this is especially true for people who have panic attacks at night, but when we just wind up on sort of that hair trigger, yeah, it's, it can happen even at night. Like your body just gets primed to do that. But here's the thing. Even though you might want to bang your fist on the table and scream, you know, expletives at the heavens and like be really angry that this is happening to you, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I will fully support you expressing that emotion. But at the same time, it's, we have to at some point drop the insistence that we must figure it out. So if you follow that chain and say, well, I'm having these out of the blue, Drew, can you talk about out of the blue or random panic attacks that come from nowhere? You have to, let's take that through. Well, I want Drew to talk about that so that I can see if I can figure out why they happen. Well, why do I have to figure out why they happen? Well, I'm trying to figure out why they happen so I can stop them from happening. Oh, and it's the stopping them from, trying to stop them from happening that causes them or contributes to them. You see the circular, see now you're on the merry-go-round. So at some point we have to break that cycle and that would be, at least for now, at least for now, maybe one day a light bulb will go off in your head or you'll be doing other work or you'll be reflecting on your life or whatever it is and you'll say, oh, I get it. Maybe this is what started to push me over the edge into having panic attacks. Maybe, but at least for now, we have to come to the conclusion that out of the blue might happen, random might happen, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We can, we can drop the requirement, the demand to figure it out, to decipher it, to figure out what the exact trigger was, because we don't have to know, because we don't have to fix it, because we don't have to prevent it. And this is that paradox at the core of everything we talk about. The more we try to stop it, the worse things get. The more we are willing to let it happen and learn that we can handle it even if it does happen, because you can, you always have, the less likely those out-of-the-blue panic attacks will happen. So if you ask somebody who has successfully turned the corner and come out the other side of something like panic disorder or agoraphobia, and you're listening to one right now, People will say, I don't understand, like, you know, oh, th this was going on in your life, this was going on in your life, you have such a stressful time, you're, you're so busy right now, how are you not having panic attacks every day? Well, because I'm, I'm not trying to not have them. I, and I know that sounds ridiculous, but from the, from the other side, if I could speak to you from the other side of recovery, I don't have panic attacks all the time. I rarely, I mean, I might have one today, I don't know. But I rarely, rarely, rarely have panic attacks now because I spend zero time trying to not panic. And that is really what made the difference for me. And that is the target that we would work on. If I was working with you in therapy, that would be our target. The target would be, I need to get away from the idea that this is 
the worst thing that can happen to me that I must prevent it, I must manage it, and I must find the triggers. And surely there has to be a way to figure this out and fix the problem. And I would say no. The issue here is you learn that even if it does happen, you can handle it, you can get through it. That's a you know, we've talked about this for since 2014 on this podcast. So you got to go back and listen to a lot of old episodes or maybe read one of my books or whatever, because I, if you're new to this, you're going to say, okay, well, how am I supposed to handle that? Well, I've been talking about this for, for a lot of years now. I've written about it. There's a specific way we would go about that. There's a method to the madness. It's not just like, oh, just let it happen and don't care or just change how you feel about anxiety. We can't do that. We have to be willing to change our experience with anxiety. And then we have to be willing to experiment behaviorally, change the way we behave. Yeah, we're going to do brave things. We're going to let scary things happen to us, recognizing that like panic doesn't always equal danger. There's a lot that goes into it, right? So unfortunately, in one podcast episode or YouTube video, I cannot give you the entire, here's all the steps from going from, you know, from like out of the blue panic attacks four times a week to no panic attacks. There's no such thing. But this is the principle here. If you're flummoxed, if you're, if you're annoyed, if you're frustrated because you feel like some or all of your panic attacks are out of the blue, and this is especially true if you are in the business of, of preventing panic or managing your body or your thoughts, and you think you're doing a really good job of that, I should talk about that for a second here. For people who get into a groove where they ha are full of rituals, that are very wide ranging, right? They may involve special drinks, special uh, schedules, maybe supplements or herbs. I'm not picking on any one of those things. They're all fine. We should all be as healthy as we could be. But when you start to stitch all that stuff together so that you feel that, okay, I got a handle on this. I am now managing my nervous system. I am managing my endocrine system. I am managing my mental health. I am choosing serenity. I am managing my peace levels. I cut out the toxicity and you feel like you've done a really good job of somehow controlling life, and then you have a panic attack, that's another really common reason why people say that was out of the blue, that shouldn't happen. Something must be wrong here. What was that? No, you just incorrectly assumed that you could find a way to literally take control over every aspect of your physical, mental, and emotional function and the world around you for the purpose of preventing panic attacks from happening. Now, when I say it that way, does that actually seem possible it's kind of not. So for people who I think have gotten very deep into rituals designed to keep them calm, regulate themselves and make sure that they will never panic again, then the, the panic attack that comes feels even more out of the blue, because it feels not justified. No, I'm doing all the things I'm the self care wizard. But it doesn't matter self care doesn't guarantee that we prevent a panic attack. So that's the story kind of on like out of the blue panic attacks. There's no such thing. If you don't have an anxiety disorder, your panic attack is probably the result of just a lot of stress in your life bubbling over and had nowhere to go. And you probably recognize that. Like, yeah, I had a panic attack because I pushed myself way beyond where I should have and I'm exhausted and I'm sick and blah, 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 blah. If you have an anxiety disorder, then your last panic attack is the cause of your next one. It becomes a relatively simple equation, even though it's not the equation you want your life can be better is more likely to get better if you're willing to at least consider the possibility that, oh, that might be true. Maybe what this goofy guy is saying is maybe there's some truth in that. Maybe I can't manage it. Maybe I cannot guarantee that I will never panic. And, and trying to guarantee that is what creates the next panic attack that I think is out of the blue, but it's not. And that's good news, right? So isn't it better to know that like, oh, Maybe it's actually not out of the blue. Maybe he's right. That's good news. You can, you can work with that because that tells you something. I can work with that. Oh, I guess I really got to work on like getting out of my rituals and getting out of my avoidance and getting out of my control and all of those things and work more on being able to handle the panic. So it changes the way you approach things. It gives you something to work on. It gives you a different direction to go in. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that makes all the difference or can anyway. Anyway. That was a lot of words on out of the blue panic attacks to tell you that there are none. So if that was frustrating for you, I'm sorry. But I think that was the, uh, the information that probably was best put out there today based on that topic. Thank you for listening. This is episode 294 of The Anxious Truth in the books. You know it's over because. Music. We have music this week. I'm going to actually take the time to put the music back in. Anyway, I will close the episode as always by asking a favor. If you are listening to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or some platform that lets you rate or review the podcast, 
maybe leave a five-star rating if you dig it. And if you really dig it, write a review because it helps other people find the podcast. And then it's a nice way to spend my time because I get to help even more people. Of course, if you're watching as a YouTube video, apologies because there is no video on this one. That's true. It's a still image. But if you're watching on YouTube, maybe like the video, hit the subscribe button, leave a comment at least once or twice a week. I do go in and, and answer my YouTube comments. It sometimes takes me a while, but I promise I do do it. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Hopefully this has been useful to you that you can use it in some way, incorporate it with the other things you hear on other episodes of this podcast and other resources that you have available to you. And no matter what you do today, to move away from the old way of dealing toward a new way of dealing where you kind of face the fear instead of trying to run away from it, manage or avoid of it, avoid it, that counts. Like every little step you take counts, no matter how small it is, they all add up and they all help get you where you want to be. So keep going. I know you could do it even when it's difficult. Thanks for hanging in there with me this week. I will see you again in two weeks in the next episode. We're out.